Hi there! Today we are going to learn how to create our first ESP IDEF project from scratch. We will learn how to set up and create a simple XAMPP application for reading and writing inputs and outputs. Let's get started! Hi, my name is Yuri R, and this is my third video of my ESP32 series. If you haven't seen my previous ones yet, make sure to check them out because we are going to use the same IDF on Visual Studio Code setup. Today we are going to go through setting up our project and learning how to use the menu config, a very useful tool to configure the main settings for our IDF project. If you are new to the channel, you may be asking why use this thing called IDF at all? What's the reason? Basically, IDF is a framework created by Spressive that allows us to have total control of everything in our firmware, which normally is very difficult to do using different approaches such as Arduino IDEs or even MicroPython. Don't get me wrong, those are usually better for quick and simple applications. But let's say you want to have many tasks running at the same time, reading multiple sensors, communicating constantly through Wi-Fi while handling multiple interruptions, everything in real time. The best way to do this is straight through IDF. To get things started, let's open Visual Studio Code, then go to File, Open Folder and create a new folder for our new project. Just remember to keep it simple, without spaces or special characters to avoid build problems. Let's open it. Now open a new IDF terminal and type idf.py create-project-p and dot and the name of our new project. For example, I will use gpio underline example. This command will create the initial structure for our project in the current directory, generating all the basic files for us. Keep in mind that you cannot use some reserved words alone, such as project, string, install, and some others. You can find a list of reserved words in the description. Now, let's go through the project files and have a look at how an initial project looks like. Here in the main folder, we basically have a C file with our project name, which is where our main function goes. And also, we will see a file called cmakelist.txt. This file is important because here we need to tell the compiler where all our source code files are located. If you create a new C file, for example, we need to specify it here. You'll notice that there is another cmakelist file in the root folder. This one contains the name of our project, and you can rename it by changing the text here if you want. These files are used by CMake which is a build system used by IDF that uses scripts called CMakeLists to generate build files. You can find more about it in the IDF documentation. The next step is configuring our project using a tool called ManuConfig. ManuConfig is a visual tool used to set up our build options and customize our project. Through this menu, we can add and remove features in our firmware. If you are familiar with Linux, you may have used MakeManuConfig before. It's the same idea. To access the menu, we just need to open a new terminal and type start idf.py menu config. In order to make my life easier, I prefer adding a button using the extension action buttons. Press F1 and type settings.json and add the following command in the action button section. Name menu config. Command Start idf.py menu config. Save the file and then click on the refresh button down here on this menu. Now let's use the button to open the menu config. This is how the menu config looks like. We can navigate using the up and down keys and pressing enter to go inside the submenu. To go back, just press ask and to enable disable features, just press the spacebar. Also, pressing the question mark key displays more information and a brief description of how a particular feature works. There are many interesting features on IDEF such as FreeRTOS, file system support, LWP and many others. These are really helpful too. So now let's use the menu config to set up the basics of our example project. First, I will show you how we can change the clock speed of the ESP32 core. Go to component config and press enter or right arrow to enter this menu. Now go to ESP32 specific and then to CPU frequency and now we can change it from 160 MHz to 240 MHz. Another important thing is to change our flash memory size. Let's press ESC to return to the previous menu and then go to serial flasher config and select flash size. If you remember my debugging video, we have seen that by default the memory is configured to use 2 MB only. 
and here we can change it to whatever our development kit has. For example, I'm using the ESP32 dev kit V1, which has 4 megabytes of flash. Some boards and modules come with different memory sizes, so check the one that you have and select the right option. In case you select the wrong number, I def you tell in the logs that the memory size appears to be wrong. This way you can confirm that you are using the right size. Let's now save the change by pressing ESC and selecting yes. After that, we can see that the menu config generates some files for us, sdkconfig and sdkconfig.old, which contain our new and previous settings as a backup. Ok, now let's click on the build button. And let's run it. As you can see, when the ESP32 initializes, we can see the change that we just did. The flash memory size now is 4 MB and the CPU clock is 240 MHz. Here we also can see the IDEF version that we are running and the version of our firmware. By the way, this dirty in the IDEF version just means that some files in the IDEF folder have been modified. It shows for me here because I have previously modified a few example project files. But no need to worry about it. And this number in the firmware version is that just because we haven't properly defined a version yet. We can just create a file named version.txt and type in our desired version. For example, 1.0.1. Then just type on the terminal idef.py full clean to clean the build folder and then build and flash the chip again. Now we have a proper version number that we can keep track of. Let's take a quick look at the build folder now. Here we can see that a lot of files have been created. For now, the most important ones here are bootloader.bin, which is the bootloader binary file that's going to be loaded when flashing the chip. Partition table.bin. This file contains the partition address for our firmware. I'm going to cover it in more details in future videos. ESPproject.bin, which is the firmware binary file of our project which will load in our microcontroller. Notice that the name of this file will change according with the name of our project. ESPproject.elf This file is used to debug the microcontroller with an external debugger. Check my debugging video for more details. Now you are ready to start developing your application. So let's make a simple example using GPIOs to learn the basics of IDEF. The first thing that you need to do is find out how to read an input and activate an output. Here, instead of giving you the functions and the commands straight away, I will show you where we can find this type of information so we can find anything in the future. The best way to find out about functions and how to use IDEF is naturally by going to Expressif's IDEF documentation. Let's open the browser and open the IDEF documentation page. Open API reference and select the peripheral we want to know about. In our case, we want a GPIO. Here we can see a lot of information about the ports in our ESP32 and how to configure and use them. First, in order to use the functions of the GPIO, we need to add the driver's head, as you can see here in the documentation. Drivers are the piece of code that provides you the ability to change, configure and transmit data to the hardware level. Think of it as the middleman between the software application and the hardware. We can build our own drivers, but usually the manufacturer of the microcontroller provides a very well implemented driver for us. In this case, we are going to add the Expressif's GPIO driver to our code by typing include driver slash gpio.h. Now let's solve these red squiggles. Like we did in my first video, we need to have the CC++ extension installed. Then click on this light bulb and select edit include path settings. This will create the CC++ properties.json file where you need to add the IDF path inside of this include path. Let's save the file and the red squiggles are gone. Next, we need to configure the GPIO that you want to use as an input. As you can see here, the function to configure a GPIO is GPIO set direction. So let's try using it. We can notice that this method expects a few parameters. And here's a good tip. We can go to the methods definition by pressing F12 and then taking a closer look at these parameters. Interesting, the first parameter expects a variable of the GPIO numt type. We can check what that is by pressing F12 here as well. Nice, now we know that the variable type GPIO numt is just a simple numeric index for the input numbers. So, in my case, I have a button connect to my GPIO 22, so I need to use GPIO numt 22 here. 
Now let's do the same with the other parameter of the GPIO set direction function. Here we can see that if I want to use my GPIO as an input, I need to use GPIO mode input as the second parameter. So let's add that. Now, in order to have a stable signal on the pin for us to read, we need to add a pull-up resistor to it, to fix the level at 2.3 volts. Luckily, the SP32 has internal resistors, and you can configure them as a pull-up or pull-down, so we don't need to add anything externally. If we look for pull-up in the IDF GPIO page, we can find the function that we have to use, which is GPIO set pull mode. Well, we know the first parameter, GPIO NAN22, but how about the second one? Let's look at the definition. So, to enable pull-up, we have to use GPIO pull-up only as the second parameter. Let's try configuring an output now. Let's set the direction of our GPIO to output, in my case, pin 26. Now, we need to read the input level in order to do something with it. In the IDEF documentation, we can see that the function that we're looking for is GPIO get level. We can see that it returns an integer value, 1 if the input level is high, and 0 if the input level is low. So let's make it do something if the input is high, otherwise, if the input is low, we do something else. Let's try making it turn an LED on when the button is pressed. In order to activate it, the IDF documentation says that we can use GPIO set level to change the output level. Now here, we need to add a small delay to this loop. The ESP32 runs a small operating system called FreeRTOS in the background. In order to not block its execution, we need to use a delay function from FreeRTOS called VTAS delay. This will add a delay and also give time to the processor to attend to the background task as well. In order to use this function, we need to add the FreeRTOS headers to our code. FreeRTOS slash FreeRTOS.h and FreeRTOS slash task.h FreeRTOS is a big topic and I'll make a separate video series about it in the future. So if you're not subscribed yet, consider doing it so you don't miss it. Ok, let's build and run it again. Now let's try the button. Cool, we can see that the LED is turned on and off based on the input. Pretty simple, right? As always, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss my future videos. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.